Hello everyone. In this video, we are going to start a new playlist called Computer Vision and Image Processing. These two have a ton of overlap and in many uh, applications, they are not exactly the same also. So, uh, but because the overlap is significant, I decided to combine them into one playlist. Because image processing uh, does not necessarily seek to uh, extract uh, higher level um, information, you know, from the data necessarily as we humans, when we see something, of course, all the processing of the picture is done in our eyes and brain and then it's the brain that extracts higher level meanings from the what we see so image processing i would say it's like mostly the parts that is done in the eyes maybe a little bit in the brain and computer vision is basically mostly utilizing those process results to uh, extract those higher level meanings but since computer vision needs processing of images, I decided to combine. So computer vision, if you want to make it very simple, we can say it is the science and technology of machines that see. Most of the devices you see these days around you, including uh, your cell phones, your laptops, your cars, and your robots, so many other uh, things around us, they have cameras, they have microphones, right? Especially cameras, and they try to use these cameras to extract meaningful information. So this computer vision is something that in the field of robotics, in the field of, uh, as you can see down here, in physics, in uh, even medicine, right, in neurobiology, in, uh, in so many other fields, you need to know how to process images. Okay, that's why I decided to make this important playlist. One of the most important thing about computer vision is every system that you design, every computer vision system that you design, should be basically independently tuned, should be application and goal dependent or goal oriented. So you cannot design, let's say, a simple system like as simple as edge detection, okay? You cannot design an edge detector that works and set up the parameters for that edge detector that works under all different conditions, right? For all different images, all different lighting conditions and so on. There is no such thing that works ideally. Uh, basically, we say one fit all. There is no such a thing. For each application, you have to, even if you are using the same edge detector, for each different scenario, you have to tune the parameters to achieve the optimum results, okay? So that's the most important thing uh, even if you use some off-the-shelf, uh, let's say edge detector, motion detector, anything like that, you know, object detector, you still have to tune it for your own application. This is extremely important. So as you can see down also in this picture, you see that computer vision and image processing, they have a lot of overlap. And then we have the machine vision. Machine vision is really mostly for the machines only, like the robots, the automation lines, and so on. Okay, and computer vision can go beyond that. So these three fields, machine vision, computer vision, and image processing, instead of me separating them into three fields like this and then talk about each one of them, I decided to have them all in one single playlist and talk about as many topics as I can for uh, basically all of them, okay? So this is the beginning, but now we want to now start talking about some important things. The first thing is the model of the camera. You know, at the end of the day, you have to deal with the camera. And this camera, they have lenses, different types, and they have this what we call a CCD or charged couple device, which is the sensor that basically receives 
the light intensity for different pixels, right? If uh, in one of my future um, videos I show you, the CCDs, they have different layers, different filters for red, green, and blue values, right? Like this. And they record them and uh, then they give you the digital image, right? And by the way, when we're talking about image processing here, we talk about digital image processing okay we are not talking about we are not talking about analog images talk about digital images which is kind of like all 99 percent of the images you see around you and uh you have to know how the world is projected onto this ccd right how the projection is happening that's one of the most important thing that you need to know and that's where the camera models come into play and one of the simplest, yes, yet most well-known and mostly used type of models for the camera is called the pinhole model camera. And the result of that, the projection res resulting from that, we call perspective projection. Now, I talked about this in one of my playlists, robotics, at the very end of it, when I talked about vision control of the robot or image-based visual servoing. I talked about this, but here I would talk about it again one more time in this playlist in case you did not go or don't want to go to my robotics playlist. So what's happening here? This is the real world. This is the scene. This is, let's say, a person, some maybe background behind the person. All you do, you consider all of the rays, the light rays that are coming from these uh, uh, scenes or the points of the uh, real world or they are reflected by these from a light source they are all passing through a single point which is really like the lens of the uh, focal point of the lens of the camera and then behind the lens you have your image plane at a distance that is equal to the focal length of the camera lambda and the picture is projected over there. All of these rays will basically come and meet each other again. And they form this picture, which is definitely going to be upside down compared to the actual world. And the size of it is not going to be the same size as the world. Definitely smaller, right? Because the size of the CCDs are much, much, much smaller than the real world, of course. Now, one of the immediate results of this pinhole model is if the object is further away from the camera, distant objects are going to look smaller when projected onto the camera. So here, I want you to focus on A, object A, and object C. Although they are the same height, but one of them has a larger distance to the camera compared to the other one. And you clearly see, if you look at their projections, that A, which is the distant object, looks far smaller compared to what? Compared to C. Okay, so as the objects get further away from the camera, they appear smaller. And the result of that is this perspective view or projection that you see, right? If you look at the railroad, the points that are further away from me that I'm taking the picture of, these points in blue are uh, further away from the camera compared to these red points. So the distance between the red points look what? Larger in the camera compared to the distance between the blue points, although the, they are both the size of the rail, right? The size of the supports between the two rails, these wooden parts, right? But you clearly see the blue is smaller than the red. And so that makes parallel lines like the rails. You clearly see the parallel lines. They are what? They are going to converge ultimately at some point on the horizon line. This is your horizon line here, this line. Okay, so this line, we call it the horizon line. This is the line beyond which you cannot see anything. And the point that these lines, these parallel lines in the depth will converge to that point. This point is what we call a vanishing point.
So this is the uh, custom thing that you see in perspective projection. And that's how a camera would see and that's how our eyes would see the real world. Okay. Now, let's get a little bit more into details of this uh, pinhole camera model and perspective projection, both in terms of the uh, technical detail and in terms of the mathematics. So how do we uh, quantify this projection? The first thing is uh, the frame that you attach to the camera each camera has a frame attached to it, not a physical frame, a virtual frame. And the X and the Y of that frame are parallel to or on the uh, image plane. And the Z axis is perpendicular to the image plane. This Z axis is what we call the optic axis of the camera. Okay, so Z axis of the camera is called the optic axis, perpendicular to the camera outward. So this is about the camera frame, X of C, Y of C, and Z of C, the camera frame. Now, when these rays are all coming in and hitting, let's say here, this point P, which is in the world, in the real world, the ray from it is coming and hitting the image plane where it hits. If we call the uh, intersection point P hat, it has some coordinates. We can call it U hat and V hat or X hat and Y hat, whatever you want to call it. We typically attach the origin of the camera frame at the pinhole. So the image plane on which the image is formed, this guy, is going to be behind the pinhole location. So the X and Y uh, axes that I had at the pinhole, X, C, and Y, C, I cannot use them here on the image plane. I instead call them U hat and v hat these are parallel to the x c and y c but with a different name good what is the distance here between the image plane and the pinhole we learned this distance is what we call lambda the focal length good and then here I'm showing you another plane is called the physical retina or actually it is this uh, camera CCD and this is where the actual pixels or the intensity of the pixels are formed to see a picture. Now you might say aren't these the same thing? Yes, in fact the only real physical thing you see in a camera is this physical retina. That's all you see. This image plane is something virtual. We just add it for the mathematical modeling. This image plane is not something physical you see in a camera. Good. And you might say, well, if they are the same thing, or maybe this distance between them is literally zero, what's the point of considering two planes? The point is this. It's called the principal point. What is this? The principal point is what? If you consider a point on the Z of the camera axis in the real world, okay, any point, if you extend the Z of C out of the camera like this, and if you consider a ray that is coming from a point along the optical axis, when it comes in the camera, it is going to intersect the image plane exactly at the center, the uh, virtual image plane. But in the camera CCD, the point that is exactly on the optical axis is not going to be exactly in the middle of the plane. It could have some offset from the middle of the plane. This point, by the way, the intersection of the z-axis, z of the camera axis, and the physical retina, this call, as I said, we call it the principal point, and it's not necessarily what, as I said, 
in the center. It has offsets from the center. And those two offsets I'm going to later show to you with two parameters called u naught and v naught. These are the offsets of the cent uh, principal point from the physical center. Okay, so that's the only reason we added these two planes to show that in one of them the point C is at the center, in the, but in the ultimate one it is not. That's the major difference. That's the only difference. Good. So let's keep moving. Now, the question is, how would you model? Well, all you need is simply what? Similarity of two triangles. If you look over here in this picture, what do I have? If I consider any point here, right? This point has a coordinate x, y, and z. And z is this distance here. This is z. And then I have some x, and then I have some y. So the coordinate of the point, in, it's, 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 it's an actual physical point, but the coordinate of that in the camera frame is called x, c, y, c, and z, c. What's the coordinate of that point in the image plane? Well, on that image plane, the coordinate of this point is, is u and v, or u hat and v hat, you might call, and some specific z, because any point on the image plane has a constant z offset from the pinhole, and that is what we've shown with lambda. Right? So your point, that is x, c, y, c, and z, c, is projected onto the point u hat v hat and lambda and if you use that and you consider one more point let's say another point here this red point here on the top and then another point red here and if you also connect these red points together then you are going to have two triangles one triangle is this guy if i can paint it in red for you one triangle is this one. The other triangle is this guy. Right? So you see you have two triangles. And these two triangles, they are both right triangles. And they have a common angle here, right? Here and here. So they are similar triangles, and if I draw those similar triangles for you, this is a view normal to the z-axis. So one axis here is the z-axis, z of c. And this vertical one, let's say, is y of c. Okay, so I'm looking in this direction. So what do I have? This distance from here to here, this guy is z. This distance is y. This distance is lambda. And this distance here is your v hat. Clearly from similarity, you see that what? You see that lambda over z is the same as what? v hat over y. So clearly v hat or your vertical coordinate in the image plane is going to be what? It is going to be uh, basically y over z times lambda. Right? And you can do a very similar thing. This time you look in the vertical direction. So it is going to be zc. It is going to be xc this time. Right, so this time you can look in this direction. And again, you're going to have two similar triangles. This is lambda this time, this is z again, this is going to be x, and this is going to be u hat. And again, you see that u hat over uh, x is going to be the same as lambda over z. And so your u hat is going to be what? x over z times lambda. 
So these two projections are going to give you what? The image plane coordinates, u hat and v hat. And you clearly see you go from a 3D point, which has x, y, and z, to a what? To a 2D point, which only has u hat and v hat. And that's what happens in any camera. You go from a 3D world to a 2D world because in a camera, everything happens on a flat plane. So you get these two initial equations that I just derived for you. Clearly, as you can see, this model is a nonlinear model. You are going from R3 to R2, right? From 3D world to 2D world. Why is it nonlinear? Because z, which is one of the parameters, one of the coordinates, as you can see, this z is what? It is in the denominator. Lambda is a constant parameter for a camera, the focal length. X and y are in the numerator, but because of z being in the denominator, this what we call perspective projection model, which is basically these two equations, it is a nonlinear model, and that's what it is. So the combination of these two is what we call the perspective projection. And you clearly see that the bigger the z is, the bigger the depth is or the distance of the object from the camera your u hat and v hat are going to be what are going to be smaller so distance object will appear smaller good so this is pinhole model and perspective projection that i explained so far going from 3d to 2d what are the units here the units are the unit of length because x y and z are unit of length so they are millimeters in the image plane, also, the units of u hat and v hat are also millimeters. So u hat and v hat both have units of mils. And that's also indicating that this lambda also has unit of length, like mil or meters or anything like that. So everything makes sense unit-wise. Good. Now... Let's talk about the second part. So, so far, we have gone from where to where. So far, we have come from the real world to what? To the image plane. Now, the question is, how do you go from the image plane to what? To the retina. What's the difference when you go from here to here? One thing I told you is the center point c hat and the and the physical retina is not centered necessarily anymore so the first thing you need to do to the u hat and v hat that you have you have to add the offsets the horizontal offset and the vertical offset and that's what we have done here using parameters u0 and v0 or u0 and v0 right or in this top equation actually you can clearly see that I have shown the offsets of the principal point. But that's not the only thing. The other thing and the other reason we considered a different plane, physical retina, from the image plane is in the image plane, everything has units of length. In the physical retina, everything has units of pixels. Remember, any image that you get has so many pixels by so many pixels, digital images, they don't have so many millimeters by so many millimeters. So now you have to go from unit of length to pixel. How do you do that? This is done through two new parameters. We call them SX and SY. What we do, we multiply U hat and V hat by SX and S. Y and then add to them U and V, U not and V not. Now what is SX and SY? Sx and Sy are the number of what? The number of pixels per each dimension of the physical retina. What does that mean? It means, for example, this size of this physical camera CCD, this one, is, let's say, for example, is, uh, let's say, uh, 18 mil or something like that, right? 
this length of the physical retina, which is 18 mil, it has how many pixels? It has, let's say, 1800 pixels. And this height of this physical retina from here to here, which is, let's say, for example, 12 mil, this corresponds to, let's say, 1200, or not necessarily always the same ratio, maybe it corresponds to 1400 pixels. So what? So the SX and the SY are these ratios. Your SY here, which is for vertical, is going to be what? It is going to be the 1400 divided by 12. And your SX, which is for horizontal direction, it is going to be the 1800 divided by 18. Right? So the ratio of the number of pixels to the physical dimension for each direction of the physical retina are these two ratios, SX and SY. Here I have done some uh, I've done some cleaning, and uh, one more thing I want to emphasize is now we incorporate this S X and S Y, multiply them by U hat and V hat. Here it's like a normalization that you are doing because this term is like what? This is like U hat times the number of pixels in the horizontal direction, if I call it nx, divided by what? By w. And so, this u hat over w, this is like a normalization, right? This ratio is going to be, let's say, between um, negative one-half to one-half. And the same thing here, this is like, again, number of pixels in the y direction divided by h times v hat, Again, this is like a normalization. Okay, so now these are the pixel coordinates. The difference is now U and V that you see, these are in units of pixels. Why? Because U hat and V hat were in millimeters. S, X, and X, Y are pixels over millimeters, so they simplify. The other thing is U naught and V naught that we added, they also share the unit of what? Pixels. So there are U naught and V naught are not physical distances. There are a number of pixel offsets from the physical center. Okay, so now U and V are pixels. And if I combine these two equations, top and bottom, you will get the final equations for uh, the perspective projection in terms of pixels. So u is going to be 1 over z s x lambda times x plus u naught, and v is going to be 1 over z s y lambda y plus v naught. And as we'll see in the next video, I need to combine, or I will combine, s x times lambda to a new parameter called alpha, and SY times lambda to a new parameter called beta. And these alphas and betas, they are constant parameters. Why? Because for a specific CCD, SX and SY are fixed. For a specific lens, lambda is fixed. So for a camera, really, alpha and beta, these two products are going to be fixed. So we can write our final equation like U equals 1 over Z alpha x or alpha over z if you want to call times x plus u naught and v to be beta over z times y plus v naught again nonlinear equations and uh, these are the final perspective projection model now there are two simplified versions of the perspective projection. One of them is called a fine projection. The other one is called the orthographic projection. I briefly mentioned them for you here. So uh, if in the real world, the depth change from one point to another of the 3D physical object is very small, so whatever object that I have, 
the z from the front of it to the rear of it is a small number like delta which is very small then i can literally consider the object to be almost like 2d or flat if that's the case i can consider as i said the object like a plane because the thickness of it is very small and if I consider this case, then if I consider here, let's say, two points on the physical object P and Q and project them onto the uh, image plane or uh, camera CCD, call them P prime and Q prime, then I can easily show you that because in this case, this parameter Z is almost what? It is almost constant because it is measured along the optical axis and the front and the back of it has very small changes, then this parameter z that you see in the denominator and makes the projection nonlinear now is going to be almost constant. So we can say these ratios, alpha over z or beta over z, these two are almost what? Constants. So your equations are going to be linear now. U is going to be a constant times x plus u naught. V is going to be another constant times y plus v naught. Now, if this alpha and beta are both the same constant, in other words, sx and sy are the same number, then both of these constants can be considered a simple constant like m. And so your u is going to be m times x. V is going to be m times y. And of course, you can add what? your u naught and your v naught to them. Still, this is a what? This is a linear mapping. Or a linear, you might call, projection. If alpha and beta are different, then your equation going to be what? A u is going to be m1 times x plus u naught and y is going to be m2 times y plus v naught or if you don't like one and two you can just call them mx and m y but clearly the mapping is going to be almost linear right and uh the good thing is it makes our future calculations, calibrations, and so many things a lot easier. But it is all under the assumption that this parameter delta, which is the change in the z, I can call it delta z. This delta z in the camera frame, this is a very small number. The object is almost flat. It doesn't have a lot of depth. Then you can use this affine projection, which is clearly linear right and where is it that we can use this simplified version as i told you the depth of the object should not be big like where like for example if you are looking at the pictures of somebody's eyes retina right if this is your eye and i'm taking some pictures to study the retina the back of the eye you know the area that you are studying right the depth of that area is very small so when i can when i want to do that instead of having the uh, perspective projection i can use the affine projection and so here are several patches taken from different areas of the retina and then they are put together it's like they are kind of stretched out right so why did i do it in several patches when you divide it into patches then you have even a better chance of using the small depth assumption so you are taking one patch here one patch here one patch here one patch here and so on and in these small patches definitely you can say z is almost constant right the dimensions are very small so for each one of them, you have one of these patches, and then when you put them together, you see now that the parallel lines do not seem to converge to a point anymore, and that distant object appearing smaller is not shown here, which is a good thing, because I don't want to see this object here in this blue uh, part to appear much smaller than here in this red part. 
right? They are very close to each other. I don't want them to be shown with different scaling. I want to see them all with the biggest size I can and without any convergence so I can easily look at the structure of the eye and make sure everything is right. You see? So for those specific cases, you can use a fine projection. And then there is another, uh, even simpler version of the perspective projection, which is called orthographic projection. This is what we use in engineering for technical drafting. When we want to talk to somebody, a technician, a machinist, and give them the views of a part I want them to machine for me, I do not care if this box that I want them to machine for me or the machinist doesn't care whether this box is what? One meter away from them or 10 meters away from them, it always should appear, let's say, one meter by one meter by one meter. I cannot say, hey, you machine this box one meter by one by one if it's close to you, but if it's further away from you, you uh, machine it like 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter. It doesn't make any sense. In the world of manufacturing, we always want what? We always want orthographic projection. What is orthographic? So if you have an object, you project it using perpendicular rays to any plane, any direction that you want, and you get different views, right? I have a playlist called uh, Technical Drafting. You can go and take a look at that and GDNT. And you see all about multi-view orthographic projection. So you project your object onto different planes. You get different views, right? So your image plane is not in one single location. You have six of them at least. And of course, three of them will be redundant. But these three other views, like front, top, and right view of the object, used to convey your design idea to the machinist. And if you look at the projecting rays, they are all perpendicular to the image plane. If you look at all these angles, they are all 90 degrees. That's why we call it ortho. Ortho means 90 degrees. The projection is 90. Well, that's not definitely the case in here. If you see here, this is my image plane, right? And these rays that are coming at the image plane, they are at all sorts of different angles. Right? They are not orthographic. They are converging. These guys are not. Which practically means what? If the rays are not converging and they are all perpendicular to the plane, it literally means your image plane is what? Is at infinity. So your image plane is very far away, correct, from the pinhole. That's where, when this guy is way, way back, you can say these parallel rays, all these uh, converging rays are going to tend to be almost what? Parallel. So the practical, or um, I would say theoretical uh, lambda, or the focal length in this case, is like what? Like infinite. And what's the good thing about it? The good thing is if you have a line like PQ and if you project it in a parallel manner using parallel rays onto the image plane and you get P prime Q prime, then the size of P prime Q prime is always the same as PQ. Okay, so U can be simply equal to X and V can simply be equal to V or a multiple of that, right? So in this case, you can say my uh, magnification factor is what? M, this parameter M that we introduce here. You can literally say this is equal to what? To um, 1. Now, uh, I know this is not how the cameras would see and this is not how we would see, but this has applications in engineering. In this course... Whenever we talk about projections, we always refer back to what? To these guys.
to the perspective projection. So affine and orthographic are special cases for special applications, but as long as we are as uh, long as we are concerned, as as far as we are concerned, we definitely want to use what perspective projection, and that's what you will see I use in my next video to talk about camera intrinsic and extrinsic parameters and camera calibration. I will use the perspective projection. So hopefully this uh, video was useful to you and I will see you in my next lecture. Thank you.